Welcome to worship on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. A special welcome to those of you who might be worshiping with us for the first time or for the first time in a long time. It's good for us to be here. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We take a moment for silent confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning may be found in your bulletin. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, 
for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, peace, and mercy to you from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Today's text is a good one, but I think the parable is likely the most skipped over portion of the whole reading. The reading itself is really divided into three different parts. First, with the disciples wanting Jesus to teach them to pray, and then with Jesus telling the parable of the friend at midnight, and finally with Jesus telling them to ask for what it is that they might need, and really ending with a second parable, asking about giving a child a fish versus a snake. The gospel invites us to reflect on a story of prayer and what it means for us to have a meaningful prayer life that directs our journey with God. So as we wander through this story, I invite you to think of those who have taught you to pray, or perhaps those whom you have taught to pray, those who have shared with you what their life of prayer has meant to them and what that looks like, and to think about our own journey with prayer, why it is that it makes us nervous to pray sometimes, certainly in front of other people, or keeps us from fully trusting in the prayers that we offer and in what it is that we receive back. And here, I will help to get you off the hook right from the start. We're always looking to grow in our prayer, and sometimes growth is hard, right? Prayer doesn't have to be long or wordy or eloquent or beautiful. At best, it should be heartfelt and meaningful. I will tell you, when I first got here, and it was Pastor Peel and Pastor Mark and I, they learned very quickly that at meals, you wanted me to pray because I am the short and fast prayer. (laughs) It got us to the food much more quickly than if we had given that privilege to someone else, right? Famous author Anne Lamott would tell you that the simplest prayer is to simply say, help me help me. Or, in another version, would be to say, thank you. Thank you. So, next time you are put on the spot to pray, right, let us pray. Thank you. Amen. (laughs) No? (laughs) All right. For you, that will work. (laughs) I think you could probably do that. We can all get on board with those. And beyond that, we should seek the words that Jesus taught us in this text when his disciples wanted to know how to pray. The Lord's Prayer certainly covers everything that we might want to say in prayer, both in terms of thanksgiving and forgiveness and what it is that we might need. And lastly, we can take comfort knowing that even when we have no words to pray on our own, it is with sighs that are too deep for words that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. (laughs) To begin today's text, Jesus invites his disciples to be brave in approaching God, who is already close to them. Jesus supports his teaching with the two parables, the parable of the insistent friend at midnight which isn't found in Matthew with the other teaching of the Lord's Prayer, and then this parable of the invitation to ask 
for what it is that you need. The common theme between the parable of the insistent friend and the Lord's Prayer is this concept of prayer and repeated references to bread being filled with what we need, whether it is by words of praise and thanksgiving and by the bread of life that is both bread in terms of hospitality that we share with one another and is the bread of life that comes to us as Jesus. This parable encourages the disciples to persist in their plea to God. What motivates a person in need to appeal to his friend at night to give him a loaf of bread is their friendship, right? The man isn't going to a stranger's house and asking for a loaf of bread at midnight. He is going to his friend and he is knocking on the door and he is asking, what can you, can you supply this with me? I need to be hospitable to my neighbor and I'm asking you to share that hospitality with me first. The bond that connects the disciples with God is more vital than friendship. It's familial, it's an intimate relationship. It's the relationship that invites the believers to persist in prayer. The parable that follows the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, when I first read it, this friend at midnight, is a little bit humorous and potentially problematic. You don't really know how somebody is going to answer their door. In an ancient culture, without instantaneous communication, without all-night grocery stores, it's not difficult to imagine being surprised by the arrival of an unexpected guest and caught without supplies that are needed for even basic hospitality. If somebody came to my door at midnight today, I'm not answering it, right? You know what I'm doing first? I'm getting out my phone, I'm looking at the camera app that I have at my front door, and I'm gonna see who's standing there long before I get close to the door. And I suspect that probably half of you would do the same. Look at the ring camera, look at the security camera and see who's at the front door. That being said, I can't imagine somebody coming to my door and asking for bread either. The last time somebody came to my door at 11.30 at night after going through the whole process of figuring out who it was, it was my neighbor to tell me that my garage door was open, <laughs> which was very kind of them for sure. And of course, right, but my initial feeling was that of fear. What are they knocking on my door for? And it was an act of hospitality and community. So it is surprising somehow, it is surprising, right, to have somebody at the front door and the picture that is painted for us is one of abandoning all concern for decorum or for personal dignity and trying to rouse the sleeping neighbor to help. Right? They went in desperate times, seeking desperate measures. I need this from you so I can show hospitality to the person who is coming to me. I think all the kids left, right? Mostly. I always have to ask if I'm going to talk about like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or any of our, any of our friends. Right. So when we hit COVID in March of 2020, it was about three or four weeks before Easter, and I have a group text with all of my girlfriends, and none of us were shopping, right? Nobody was running to Target to grab things or running to Costco to pick up a bag of this or a bag of that. So it got to be the day before Easter, and one of my girlfriends sent a very frantic text and said, we don't have any Easter candy. And I went, I got you. I have all the Easter candy, because I buy it as soon as it comes out and eat it all the way until Easter. Right? And I know enough to buy far more than I need so I can eat as much as I want and not have to worry about it the night before Easter. Right? So we went on a mission, a covert mission, to deliver the Easter candy in an unseen sort of way, quiet, along the side of the house, in the dark, because desperate times call for desperate measures so we can show the hospitality that we need to, whether it's in our with our friends or with our family. The temptation here is to interpret this parable as an indication that God, too, needs cajoling, that maybe he needs poking, or at least, at least that that hallmark of Christian prayer is persistent, right? That we get what we need when we push a little bit, when we remind, when we constantly 
tell them, this is what I need. The Greek word, anadea, is best translated not as persistence in this reading, when speaking of persistence in prayer, but is actually better translated as shamelessness. It implies a boldness that comes from familiarity, right? We can be shameless in our asking if we're comfortable in who we're doing the asking with, or if we are just beside ourselves in our need. The parable's breadless host asks only once, making bold to count on his neighbor's conformity to the duties of hospitality. He is, in this sense, shameless, counting on his friend's desire to not fail communal expectations. See, also, Jesus intimates, should we make bold to offer our petitions to God, shamelessly calling on God to keep God's promises? Sometimes I wonder, do we really need to call out to God and cajole him into keeping his promises? In a commentary written by the professor of New Testament at Lutheran and Southern Cemetery, Cemetery, Seminary, <laughs> he interprets this passage, particularly this work, as saying the persistence reading of the parable may imply that God is reluctant or unaware and needing to be roused by our prayers before God will do anything. It may imply that prayer is the means by which we harass God until God finally submits to doing what it is that we want. But the notion that repeatedly we must bang on the doors of heaven if we are to catch God's attention is hardly an appropriate theology of prayer. I think shamelessness may come before persistence in seeking what it is that God wants us to come to him for. The better option for translating that word is shameless, a lack of sensitivity to what is proper, a willful lack of concern about acquiring any public shame. It's a meaning that's used only once other time in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where it's placed in parallel with disgrace. The question then becomes, whose shamelessness is the reason for the sleeper to get up and give what is requested? Is the petitioner shameless for begging in the middle of the night? Or would the sleeper be shameless for not getting up to help? Either is possible, and either still seems fraught with theological trouble. If the former, then the parable calls us to be shameless in our approach to God which hardly seems better than treating the parable as a lesson about our persistence. In the end, do we really want to trust in the character of our prayers, whether persistent or shameless? If the shamelessness is instead attached to the sleeper, what does it say about God? Is this what hallowed be your name really means, that God will act only out of potential shame if the prayer is to be ignored? Sometimes there's a, there's a helpful suggestion about this parable and its dynamic of shame that comes from another theologian. The petitioner indeed acts with shameless disregard of his neighbor and perhaps the others who he may have woken up as he was banging on the door. But the focus quickly shifts to the one in bed. Though the petitioner acts in a shameful way, his neighbor deals with the shame in a way that will bring honor to both of them. And perhaps that's the better way to view what hallowed by your name means. God will act to honor God's name even when we act in dishonorable ways. Final piece of this text is another direction of how it is that we should pray. The prayer serves as an affirmation of the worldview Jesus teaches and embodies suggesting how the good news might be made manifest in us. If we ask, if we seek, and if we knock, Jesus says, we will surely receive and find the door will be open for us to the Father's favorite and fundamental gift, which makes possible the prayer's fulfillment. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift that resides and dwells within each one of us, the gift that we have already been given is the Father's favorite gift to us the one that knows our prayers when we don't, the one who is on our lips when we don't know what words to use.
The Holy Father wants us to knock and find the Spirit waiting to enliven and feed and defend us. The point of prayer is not to change God's mind, but to shape ours, to make us fit for the kingdom, ready to live the only life possible in God's household, which is one of love. Prayer doesn't need to be hard or magnificent or full of words that sound perfect and churchy. God hears all our words, even and especially those that are unspoken. We are simply pushing against an open door when we pray. So I invite you to be shameless in your prayer, in your relationship with God, in asking for what it is that you need. Perhaps it's not about persistence so much as coming to God fully vulnerable as disciples who want to grow and to learn. This past Thursday night in San Francisco, I joined all of our kids and adults who are out there doing, doing their mission work and doing some um, faith formation. Thursday night, we joined what is called the San Francisco Open Cathedral. And it's worship service that is put on by a consortium of preachers and congregations and it's held at the 16th and Mission Street BART Plaza. It's the subway. So you come up out of the BART, the subway, and you land at 16th and Mission. It's not a nice part of town, it's safe to say. When you come out, it smells. There's a lot of noise, not all of it friendly. There are a lot of people that look nothing like anybody here does who come out to the 16th Street Mission Station and together we meet there for worship. So we came up and there's folding chairs all over the plaza. And there are a couple of pastors there who do street ministry, mostly as their call. And together at 530, we began by singing Amazing Grace. There are no song sheets. There was a bulletin. I will say there was a bulletin there. There was a guitar player who was supposed to be there, but got stuck in traffic on the way. And we began worship with the liturgy just as we did here this morning. We had a greeting, we confessed our sins, we sang, we sang the same songs that we sing here, all from memory. We shared a meal together. We talked with one another. We had fellowship when it was all over. And I think the experience for each of us who was there is that we can worship together. We can recognize this liturgy that has been with us for thousands of years and these prayers that we say in the language that is familiar to us, in the words that are familiar to us, to one God who is the same to all of us, despite our differences, despite how we look or how we come. Because in front of God, all of us are shameless. We are vulnerable, but we carry no shame coming to God and offering our prayer, shameless as we come to God in prayer, shameless as we ask for help, shameless when we want to offer good hospitality and need others to show it to us first, shameless in our prayer because it's not to change God's mind but to shape ours, shameless as we learn to pray together, shameless in who we are how we gather, and how we pray. So it is my hope that together we pray boldly and bring ourselves before God asking and seeking and knocking without shame, knowing that God is with you and for you no matter what. Amen. We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that.
May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord.